before we jump in, I do want to say to you that some of this can seem overwhelming. You just have to be patient with yourself, and you just have to do the work. Uh, you may not do it while we're here, but you just got to keep working at it while we're here, and you do it afterwards. Trust me, it didn't just come natural to me. I had to get flashcards and still get flashcards because there's always new uh, ap apostolic. There's always, there's always new apologetic arguments and apostolic arguments, sure. But there's always new ones that are being kind of, that are constantly coming out and ideas and, you know, there's God's just unfolding all kinds of revelation. So you just have to memorize, 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 memorize. So be patient with yourself, but do the hard work. It's not going to happen. You know, if you take the flashcards and you put them under your pillow and you sleep on it, that probably won't do it. But uh, you can't say, it's okay to say, God, bring this to my remembrance, but you can't say bring it to my remembrance because that doesn't work. Has to be, you have to put, do the work to put it in. Then he can bring it out, okay? So anyway, I'm going to try to slow down a little bit today. I think last week I, Rhonda wanted to stone me because I was going so fast that I was, um, I was skipping parts of my notes. And uh, so you actually didn't get all my notes last week. Well, you probably looked at them, and then you, you got all of them, but you didn't get them while I was talking. And so I missed a few. So anyway, welcome to week four of uh, Apologetic Study. We're going to review last week a little bit and then dive right in. So last week we were continuing our journey through the classical approach. If you remember what that is, the classical approach to apologetics. We, we started with how truth about reality is knowable, which was point one, and we did a re, kind of a rehash. We followed that opposites cannot both be true, right? That's the, the second point of the 12 points of the classical apologetics approach. Um, two foundational points we explored in weeks earlier, right? So it was a recap at the beginning. Then, though, we, we tackled the question, is it true that the theistic God exists? Which, that's the third point. And that's where we landed last week, and that's where we're picking up today. We're kind of doing that over two weeks. Is it true that this theistic God, theos means God in Greek, but the theistic God that we follow, or the God that created all things, the, the singular God, the eternal God, is it true that he exists? And so we, we covered three core arguments. We covered the cosmological argument, the fine-tuning argument called the, anyone remember? Teleological argument, which is the second argument. Surge comes under the cosmological, though. We'll come to that in a second. Good, good, good thing. And then we, we covered the, the third one was the moral argument, right? And so focusing how that all three of these arguments support the existence of God. So each argument provides compelling evidence for why the, the universe points to an intelligent creator. And I always want to remind people that this is not a Bible study because we, I don't even know if we're going to open a Bible verse while you're here. You're like, you went to church and didn't have a Bible verse? No, it's, remember, it's from general revelation, not special. And so we're looking all at general revelation through. This doesn't say we're never going to mention Scripture, but it's not the, the focus. So we're going to recap the syllogisms so that we can remember, see if anybody knows them. And you won't get a... You won't have any negatives from me if you don't, but we're going to see if we do. Does anyone remember the cosmological argument, the three points to it? Anybody want to go for it? Whatever begins to exist has a cause. That's premise one. Premise two, the universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. And you can see that it just makes sense. Remember, a syllogism... What, what happens is if the first premise is true and the second premise is true, that it follows that the conclusion would be true. That's how you can, that's a proof or a syllogism. So if something begins to exist, it had to be caused. We know that. The universe began to exist. Now, what did we, you jumped ahead, but what did we use? What was the acronym we used to say? Yeah, SURGE. Does anybody remember that? You don't, if you don't, it's okay, but do you remember what SURGE stands for? Second Law of Thermodynamics. The universe is expanding. Radiation. They saw radiation, background radiation. Galaxy seeds, right? Which was the remnants of the, the, the explosion, the galaxies. And lastly was Einstein's theory of relativity, which says that three things started at the Big Bang, right? Time, space, and matter had a, had a beginning, right? Which means something timeless, spaceless, and immaterial started it. Good job, guys. It's a good argument, right? Cosmological. It's actually called the, the Kalam cosmological argument. And um, 
Uh, if you ever want to read more on it or watch videos on it, I definitely recommend William Lane Craig. He's a brilliant, brilliant guy, does a lot of teaching on it. And then we went into the fine-tuning argument or the teleological argument. And so the fine-tuning of the universe is due to either three things, physical necessity, chance, or design. And remember, we talked about that. It's not physically necessary that it's here. It's definitely not by chance that it's here, right? So it had to be designed, and we went through the arguments for that. So it's not due to physical, parents too, it's not due to physical necessity or chance. The conclusion, therefore, is due to design. This is an argument for God based on how finely tuned everything is. Just the complexity, to think that the complexity happened, you know, on its own is, is beyond the, the pale of probability, right? So people can say that. Remember we talked about the, the people say, well, we're here, aren't we? And we used the firing squad analogy, right? Nobody who, who had 100 people pointing a gun at them and was blindfolded and all the guns went off would say, well, I'm here, aren't I? They'd say, no, there's something rigged here because somebody should have shot me. <laughs> Right? It's kind of the same thing. <laughs> exactly. The, that is true. They missed by design. I like it. So the moral argument, the third one, if God does not exist, he kind of goes backwards, then objective moral values and duties do not exist, right? Because otherwise, you're like, well, where would they have come from? Obje why do we have objective moral values? So you kind of explain through that process, we do have them. We all know you're not supposed to kick old women. You're not supposed to eat babies. You're not supposed to do weird stuff, Right? You're not supposed to eat cats in Ohio. I'm just joking. I started to that. So it's, <laughs> don't want to open a Pandora's box here. But premise two, it is not due to physical necessity or chance. And we go through that, those arguments of why. Therefore, it is due. I'm sorry. I'm on the wrong thing. Objective moral values and duties do exist. We do have objective moral values. We're going to talk about them, right? All of us have them. Unless you take the smoke detector batteries out, right? The, the conscience. We have a conscience with knowledge. We know things are wrong, right? People are like, well, no, I think it's just culture. No. In every culture, we know it's wrong. Now, we may violate that and talk ourselves into gassing people, but that's not, doesn't make it right. We know it's wrong. The world knew it was wrong. The world still knows things are wrong. And that's why we're so upside down on some of these things that the world is trying to say is okay, but, but aren't. But you can get a seared conscience, by the way. Right? You can talk yourself into doing the most deplorable things. It's called the hardness of your heart. Right, And so objective moral values and duties do exist, therefore God exists. So that's the moral argument. So if you remember, I said we, you know, we were primarily just for these two weeks going to focus on five arguments, although there are a lot more. There, I just, we would just be weighted down week after week. But these five, if you can really focus on them, will help you. But if you also remember last week I shared with you that oftentimes, if you don't have opportunity to actually go through these arguments, simply stating them is just as po powerful for some people. Only because most people aren't even thinking about the things that we're talking about. Does that make sense? Or at least get some, remember, if we can move people one step closer, that's the goal to Jesus. We don't have to get them the whole way. Just one step closer. That's it. So does anyone remember what the five is? They, start, they all start with God is the best explanation. Yeah, so the one, first one is God is the best explanation for the beginning of the universe. And, you, and if, you, if you just stop there, you could say, don't you agree? I mean, what else could it be? You know, you, you get them at least thinking. The second one is God is the, the best explanation for the fine-tuning of the universe, right? The third one is God is the best explanation for objective moral values not subjective remember objective we all have them there's objective things you just know you're not supposed to shoot your mother right i mean you just know that we all know that um and then the the, the fifth, fourth and fifth one are what we're going to cover tonight god is the best explanation for why there's something rather than nothing or you can also call it why god is the best explanation for why there's anything at all it's, it's the same argument, but depending on whatever, you can phrase it however it sounds easier for you to remember. You don't have to remember both of them, but I usually say God is the best explanation why there's something rather than nothing. And then the last one is God is the best explanation for why we have consciousness. And we're, we're going to cover these tonight, okay? So it's good to memorize the list. It's good to memorize the syllogisms. But you have to understand, if you get the syllogisms down, you still have to be able to talk about each premise 
in a way that is meaningful in a conversation. That's what I was trying to tell you with, with, with apologetics light. You don't have to get them all down. If you got one really, really well, I, you know, William Lane Craig I was just talking about, he really, he, if you asked him, if you, if you just looked up the video, William Lane Craig, best apologetic answer, he's going, he, that's his go-to. He goes to that one. He did his PhD on it. So he likes it. You may like the moral. I like C.S. Lewis, loved the moral argument. He used that more than any of the other arguments. They're all good. It's good to know all of them because sometimes we're going to go at the end of today, we're going to kind of go through times when you might use different ones at different times and scenarios. And that's also very important to know when to use them and when not to use them because some people uh, don't care much about science, but they all understand morality, right? And some people are very heady and scientific, and you might go more science. So we covered the free first three. So tonight, we're going to get into the other, another powerful argument for God's existence. So we talked about the beginning of the universe, the fine-tuning, objective morality, and now we're talking about why is there anything at all? Why is there something rather than nothing? It's really the most basic question, isn't it? It's the basic question. Why is there anything? Why? Right? Why? Why is it all here? Why am I here? People ask the question, why am I here? This is a good thing for you to bring this argument in and say, yeah, that's a great question. Why are any of us here and why is anything here, right? And so then you want to give the, what was that? What was that? Yes, that, that's exactly, that's a good time when you can go in there. Why is there a universe? Why are there stars? Why are there planets? Why are there rivers? Why are there mountains? Why are there cats and dogs? Why are there people? Why is there something rather than Nothing at all. So this is actually another cosmological argument, by the way. It's just framed a little different. It's actually, it was, it was actually um, started by this guy. His name is um, Leibniz, um, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. Huh? Wilhelm, Wilhelm Leibniz. Yeah, we're going to do it in the English way, though. So Wilhelm was that uh, was you know all the seal that running behind him he actually is the is the the father of calculus very smart guy right so it's this is called the argument for contingency it's a good one now this is a little headier than some of the last ones you're like oh no rob but we're going to take our time we're going we're not going we're going to slow it down a little we're going to talk through it it's a great argument if you can learn it okay it was first proposed by him um so this question, why is there something rather than nothing, it might sound simple, but it's one of the most profound questions that people ask. And tonight, we're going to see why God is the best explanation for the existence of anything rather than nothing. So here's the syllogism we're going to look at. This one's a little weightier, but we're going to break it down, remember. So let's talk about it. Premise one, everything that exists has an explanation for its existence either in the necessity of its own nature or in an ex external cause. Yes. So I'll say it again. Everything that exists has an explanation for its existence, either in the necessity of its own nature or in an in eternal cause. Premise two, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God. Premise three, the universe exists. Ah, you said, man, Rob, all the rest only had three. We have four here. <laughs> three premises plus a conclusion. Therefore, the explanation of the universe's existence is God. That's it. So let's look at each of these premises. Because in order for the conclusion to be true, the premises all have to be true. The first one is the one that you've got to kind of get your mind around. But as you do, and the more you talk about it, and the more you look over these notes, it will, it will, it will be easier to explain, okay? So let's start with this first premise. The idea that that uh, the idea here is that everything needs an explanation. So here's the thing. Some things exist necessarily. Okay? Which means their existence doesn't depend on anything at all. That's what necessarily means. They just exist necessarily. Now, we would immediately, as Christians, say, well, well of course, we know who that is, Right? But there are other things, if you're talking to somebody, especially that's science-minded, that would say there's other things that may fit in that category. Now, ultimately, I'm not going to go in. This is a sidebar, and I actually put a little supplemental note you can read later. But uh, we believe that everything, even these things, are by God. But let's, 
let's start with this. Some things exist necessarily. They exist by the necessity of their own nature. Many people would, would place abstract things like numbers in this. Like the number six, six exists even if no people existed anymore. Six is always six. Anywhere in the universe, six will be six. It's, it, and it's not changed. As a matter of fact, it wasn't invented. Six is, was discovered. Six times six being 36 was discovered. It is a, it's just a fact of science that's, that's there. It's a fixed fact. Isn't that amazing? It's like we're discovering mathematics. That's okay. We'll come back to you. So many people would, would put abstract numbers. Last week, you talked about the laws of logic. Another one. It's just there. The laws of logic exist if all the people stop we're no, we're no longer on the planet, and all the trees, and the whole earth basically was destroyed. The laws of logic would, it would still have the laws of logic. They would still exist because they're just there. It's, it's logical. They can't be changed. They can't be, you can't say that two things can, that are the opposite are both true because that violates logic, right? Does that make sense? So they argue that these things exist necessarily because they're true in every possible world. In other words, it's really good for people who love the multiverse. You could say if there are multi-universes, which I don't believe in and I don't think there's evidence for, but if there were, in every possible existence that God could have created a universe, these would still be true. Mathematics would be true. The laws of logic would be true. So these are, these are called things that exist necessarily, okay? Just remember that. They necessarily exist. Other things like people or chairs, or even the universe, exist contingently. So you have contingent things and necessary things. That's, that's the two different types of things. So a contingent thing means it relies on something outside of itself for its existence. And for example, a chair only exists because someone made it. The same goes for everything in the universe. If the conditions were right, they, they wouldn't be here, right? Another way of, of stating this first premise is to say this. Everything exists either necessarily or contingently. That's it. That's the only options. It either exists in and of itself, necessarily, or it exists because something caused it to exist. Some, something made it exist. Is this making sense? You guys are looking at me like you're going crazy. You got me? Let's start with an example. So imagine we're walking in the woods, okay? And we find a glass ball. And it's the size of a basketball. And it's just sitting there on the ground. Perfectly glass, yeah. What would you think? You wouldn't assume it appeared out of nowhere, right? You'd immediately wonder, how did it get here? Yeah. Who put it there, exactly? The ball clearly doesn't exist by necessity, so it has to have an explanation, okay? Now let's think bigger. Imagine the glass ball is the size of a car. Would you still need an explanation for why it's there? Of course you would. The, the size doesn't change the fact that it exists contingently. So it needs an explanation, right? Right? Now, let's take it a step further. Imagine the glass ball was the size of the United States or even the size of the entire world. Would that make it any less probable that it needs an explanation? No. In fact, the bigger the ball, the more obvious it becomes that something or someone must have caused it to exist. Now, think of the universe itself. The universe is far larger than any glass ball. This is a good argument, guys. This story I'm telling you is what you want to use because people like narrative, right? The universe is far larger than any glass ball we could imagine, but just like the glass ball, the size of the universe doesn't change the fact that it needs an explanation. It doesn't exist by necessity. It exists contingently. And because of that, we need to look for an, an external cause to explain why the universe and everything exists at all. Do right, you get it? It's, it's a good argument. That's premise one. So premise two says if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God. Now that's a little deeper. If the universe exists, 
then something must have caused it. The universe can't explain itself. It didn't just pop into being out of nothing. I mean, if things just pop out of nothing, then why aren't things still popping out of nothing? I mean, why is a zebra not popping up in this room? Why are, you know, why are bags of money and gold not just popping up? Things don't just pop up out of existence. So the best explanation for the existence of the universe is God, an external, all-powerful, and now you can actually borrow from Einstein if you wanted to because you know about him. You can say, by the way, Einstein proved that the theory of relativity, you can throw it in there because you know it. He said that time, space, and matter has a beginning. So the universe, we know, had, a be had something started based on this law of contingency, and so something timeless, spaceless, and immaterial had to start it. You see how you're leading to the same kind of argument. We'll explore why this, this best explanation in a moment, but for now, just keep in mind that if there is a cause for the universe, that cause has to be outside of time, space, and matter to be able to create everything from nothing. Premise three, the universe exists. This one is straightforward, right? <laughs> you, me, the stars, the planets, the trees, the squirrels, you know, the ones that rob your bird feeder, everything exists. If people want to deny that, we got other issues, right? So premise three is pretty easy. So the conclusion is therefore the explanation of the universe existing is God. Do you see how that's a logical argument for God on contingency? So if everything that exists has an explanation of the, and the universe exists, then the best explanation for why the universe exists is God. The universe didn't just come from nowhere. It had to have an external cause. It's called ex nihilo. It didn't come out of nothing. Ex nihilo would be nothing. Nothing, you know what no thing mean? Nothing means no thing. So no thing could not create something like the universe. But there's actually, believe it or not, there's a, there's a scientist who actually wrote a book called The Universe from Nothing, and it's a bestseller. A couple years ago it was, which is completely ridiculous. Because even explaining his nothing, he, he creates things to explain nothing, which is not a thing, because nothing is no thing. Yeah, exactly. It's just nothing. So let's break down with another example to help us see it clearly. Now, the reason I like examples is you can remember the examples. It's so funny. A lot of times when I'm preaching a message, and even Pastor Eric, and we give a story in our, in our sermons, people get home and we say, what do we preach on Sunday? They're like, I don't know, but I remember the story, <laughs> he said. So stories are always good, right? So imagine you come home and you find your living room full of balloons, hundreds of balloons, not just any balloon, but all of them are shaped like dogs, some like cats, ones like your Uncle Bob. Now, you wouldn't just walk in and say, well, I guess... There are balloons now, and then I'm going to go make a sandwich. No, you'd want to know, where did they come from? Why are they all in my house? And someone must have put them there. You'd start looking for an explanation. In the same way we see the universe, we can't just shrug and say, well, it's here. Why is there anything at all? And just like with the balloons, the best explanation is that someone, God, caused it to be here. It sounds juvenile, but it's... It is logical, and it's ironclad. Why can't the universe explain itself? Now, some people might say maybe the universe just exists on its own. Now, we talked a little bit about that. If you remember, you could actually borrow back again. Do you remember the argument for why it can't be timeless? Because you can't, the latter, or you, can't, you cannot travail a timeless timeline you'd never arrive at today. It could not be timeless. It's provable. We also talked about the law of thermodynamics. We, the universe is running out of usable, usable energy. So these all can kind of overlap because truth is truth. Do you understand? You can borrow from some from, from the others. But So they might say the universe just exists on its own without needing an explanation. Everything we know about the universe tells us that it had a beginning. And you can Go to some of those arguments again. You can go. You could bring in surge if you wanted to. Remember, last week we talked about the universe not being eternal. So remember how and practice those and get those down. Let's look at another example. Imagine you're walking in the woods. You stumble across a shiny new lamp. We're going to use a lamp this time. You wouldn't just say, "Well, I guess I'm sorry, a laptop." And I put, I said, "Lamp, laptop, or iPhone might be better for today, right?" You would. You wouldn't say, "Well, it's always been here." <laughs> Or maybe it made itself, right? Whenever we see a painting, we always assume a painter, right? Always. When we see a sculpture, 
Sculptor. Isn't that a good one? I like that one. So what about some objections? Now, some people might ask, why does the universe need an explanation? Can it just be eternal? Remember, what do you, how would you answer that? Exactly. You'd use the arguments that we talked about, about infinite time, right? Good. Others might, uh, might say something else caused the universe. Why does it have to be God? Well, you say, well, help me with this. What else fits, fits the timeless, spaceless, and immaterial? I mean, seriously, I'm open to it. If there's something else, you tell me what's timeless, has no time. The Bible calls them, I, I remember I said it wasn't going to be a Bible study, but we'll do it since we're Christians. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, timeless, spaceless. We know that we occupy space because we're physical. But he's not physical. He's spiritual. So he's not bound by space at all. Matter of fact, we know the Bible tells us he's everywhere at the same time. He's omnipresent, right? Because he can be because he's not physical. So he's timeless, spaceless, and he's immaterial. He doesn't have anything, right? So he's... So tell me else, you know? Now, somebody would say a a disembodied mind. I've heard that. Well, that's good. I think we could call God a disembodied mind. Why not? He has a mind, the mind of God. I mean, no no one can know the mind. He, He certainly reasons, and he has rationality, but he's a spirit, right? disembodied. He's a disembodied mind. That's fine. I'd say, I'd say, yes, I'll go with your disembodied mind. We just call him God. <laughs> Why does it matter? This is the question. It's a deeply personal question. If God is the reason there is anything at all, then he's also the reason that we're here, you and I. And this is where you can make it personal when you're talking to somebody. The fact that the universe exists points to a creator who must be personal. He must be intentional. It tells us a lot about him because we have these other things like love and joy and care and nurturing and parents and all these things tell us about this God. He's He's not just a random deistic God who wound us up like a clock and set us on a shelf and walked away. But man, there's something about us that are, that's just beautiful, right? Even the universe. Even the fact that he loves us enough. I told you a little bit. I, I touched on it at the very end last week. It's called the anthropic principle. Anthropos is Greek for, for man or human, humanity. So the anthropic principle says that it seems to be that everything was so fine-tuned so that we could be here. But boy, doesn't that tell us how amazing God thinks of us, how much he loves us, that he would set the earth at the right axis and the sun the right distance and put Jupiter to keep us from crashing into asteroids and do all these things and make gravity and do everything like he did just so we could be here? Yeah, because he says we're created in his image and he cares about us that much. It's just a beautiful way of opportunity. If you can slow this down, you can say, isn't it crazy that there is something rather than nothing? tells us about that creator. Do you see how it can kind of unfold into a really good conversation with somebody if they're, if they're open? If they're not open, you're wasting your time anyway, though, right? So let's recap. We've seen that God is the best explanation for while there's something rather than nothing. The universe doesn't exist by necessity. And it didn't create itself. It had a cause. And that cause is God, just like with the balloons, the laptop, or anything else we encounter in life, the universe needs an explanation. And the best explanation is a powerful, eternal God who brought everything into existence. That we came from something. Not just something. Boy, he's something, right? It's amazing. I love all of the descriptors in Scripture. He's the way, the truth, the life. He is love. He is, he is those things. Remember, subsistent existence. He's existence itself. Everything comes from him you could get you can get pretty deep and and heady with this stuff but it's it to me it just unveils as you're talking to someone the beauty of this god that we serve right how how precious he is so let's move on anybody want let's, any comments on that any thoughts about this all right what's that yeah romans one twenty is a great one god has been seen right Okay, let's move on. God is the best explanation for why we have consciousness. This is the next argument. Remember, these are the five arguments as part of the why is there, does a theistic God exist, right? So we know that we're we're giving evidences for the fact that there is a theistic God. So the syllogism for this argument 
is this. If God does not exist, consciousness would not exist. Premise two, consciousness exists. Conclusion, therefore, God exists as the best explanation for consciousness. This one, I think, is one of the easiest arguments, because I think even a kid, even a young kid, could, can get it. I think a young kid could get a lot of these arguments, honestly. <laughs> you think, have you ever seen something come from nothing? Most little kids would say, uh, of course not. It's the adults who have problems, right? So premise one, if God does not exist, consciousness would not exist. So to understand this premise, we need to think about what consciousness actually is. So consciousness isn't just brain activity. It's not just the fact that I have a brain. We do have brains. We know that it takes place in the brain. But it's not just brain activity. It's the ability to be aware of ourselves. It's called self-actualization. You actually can sit and think about that you're here. You can think about the fact that you're thinking about something. I, I, I love, I'm, I'm really getting interested in this idea of what's called aboutness. Yeah, like we're always thinking about something, but about, aboutness is kind of weird when you think about it. It's like we're thinking about, you're thinking, when I said that, you're not thinking about me talking about aboutness, <laughs> which tells me you have a conscience. It's that part of you that's just, it's not just your brain, it's, it's metaphysical. It's weird. You can't, it's, it's, you can't put it in a microscope. You can't look at it. You can't examine it scientifically. And that's why, that's why a lot of scientists hate it, and they try to do reductionism and say it's just the brain. No, it's not just the brain, folks, and this is what we're going to talk about, right? So it's the ability to be aware of ourselves, to think, to reflect, to have subjective experiences, this is called the hard problem of consciousness because it's incredibly difficult to explain how mere material, matter, just the physical stuff, could ever give rise to something as profound as self-awareness. It's just a brain. It's, it's just, it's just uh, you know, synapses and, 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 and lock and key transmission between cells. And if you look at that. But no, there's more than just that physical. I mean, right now you're thinking about what I'm talking about, right? If I say red, all of you just thought of the color, right? Isn't that amazing? Because you're consciously aware of me talking about red. If I say zebra, there's no zebras here. But there's no physical zebra, but you guys know what I'm talking about because you have an idea of zebra, right? Just based on that. So let's consider the naturalistic view for a moment. If everything came purely by random physical processes, which is what some people are trying to say. We're just time plus chance plus matter. We're just here because the universe started itself and continued, and we're just here randomly. Atoms bumping into one another. That's all we are. We, uh, uh, then how do we get something as unique and non-physical as consciousness? From a purely materialistic perspective, we're just collections of atoms but atoms on their own don't have thoughts they don't have feelings they don't have awareness let me let me give an example i love that there's a there's another really good apologist if you guys remember these and write them down these john lennox he's a great guy the the sad thing is right now in our culture a lot of the great apologists are aging and god's raising up some we got to pray he raises up some really strong ones because these some of these guys ravi zacharias who died a couple years ago strong apologist uh, I think William Lane Craig is, is in his 70s. Um, uh, John Lennox, uh, he's probably close to 80 or maybe in his 80s. He's a brain apologist and he's a mathematician and he teaches at Oxford University. He says this. I like his, his, his illustration about consciousness. He says, imagine you walk into a kitchen and you see a kettle boiling on the stove. And you're curious. And so you say, why is the kettle boiling? You could have two different kinds of explanations. The scientific explanation, which is, remember, they're going to give the scientific explanation. They might say, well, the kettle is boiling because heat energy from the burner is being transferred to water. The heat causes the water molecules to become faster, eventually reaching the boiling point where the liquid turns into steam. So this is a detailed scientific, not too detailed, but scientific description of the physical processes at work. It tells you how the kettle is boiling by explaining the mechanism of heat transfer and molecular movement. That's the scientific explanation, right? But the personal explanation, another person might say, the kettle is boiling because I want to make a cup of tea. 
Both of the statements are true. One's scientific, one's totally metaphysical. I just wanted to have tea. What does that mean to want to have tea? To have an aboutness where you're thinking about having tea. And right now, let's think about having tea, guys. Can you think about it? Tea bag, put some, put some cream in it, right? I like cream because I lived in England. Stir it up, maybe a lump of sugar. Right now, you're all going there, right? We're all about tea, aboutness, because we're conscious. Nothing physical going on right there. I know, there are physical things. My brain is firing. They can put, uh, they can put, um, uh, they, can, they can look at my brain through the means that they do. I'm trying to think of the names of it. But they can, they can, they can do, take pictures of my brain and see activity in certain areas when I'm thinking those thoughts. And that just makes sense because, of course, the activity happens in my brain. But the metaphysical side cannot be explained. Right? Are you with me? So it's not a scientific explanation, but it explains purpose or reason. This argument, this not even an argument, but this explanation helps people to see that there are different ways of looking at things. And science doesn't always answer them all. Because people want to say, well, science is the, the only... You know, it's funny. When someone says to you, everything can be explained by science, you say, okay, well, can, the, can that statement, everything can be explained by science, be explained by science? It can't because it's metaphysical, because it's a conscious issue. Do you understand? So even the statement isn't scientific. How can we look at that in a microscope? How can we examine that statement, Right? Let's take a moment to compare the two explanations. Both are true, but they're different. So this analogy helps us understand why consciousness cannot be explained solely by scientific or physical processes. Scientific ex explanations can describe the mechanism behind the brain, neurons firing, chemical reactions, electrical impulses. But here's what they can't explain. They can't explain the why. They can do the what, but why? Why am I having thoughts about a zebra or tea? Or do I exist? Or is there a God? Or Those are all metaphysical. Those are conscious, consciousness. And so in the same way that the, the boiling water requires a scientific and personal explanation, human consciousness requires both a physical explanation and a personal, intentional one. And the best explanation for why we have consciousness is not just the physical processes of the brain, but the existence of a personal creator who made us with the capacity for thought, reflection, self-awareness. It also lets us know that he must be personal, thoughtful, and self-aware, right? Which we know he is. In fact, there's no good natural explanation. There isn't. There is no natural explanation for how consciousness arose. Many philosophers and scientists acknowledge that no matter how much we study the brain, it doesn't explain why we have experiences. I mean, think about if evolution is purely just random. We started from nothing, you know, you know, from, from what do they say, from the, the stew to the zoo or something like that, to you, I don't know what it is, the I'm like the goo to you, to the zoo to you. That would be <laughs> that would be the just just random processes. How would we jump from just materialism to this ability to have dreams and have love and have care and nurture and all these things? Isn't that amazing? Premise two: consciousness exists. We know that. Consciousness is something we all experience. We're aware of our thoughts, our feelings, what's happening around us. It's more than just processing information. It's about being able to reflect on ourselves, to think about our thoughts, to feel emotions deeply. That ability to step back and consider our own existence, our choices, our experiences. We talked about Descartes a couple weeks ago, and I'll mention him again. Remember, he said, I think, therefore, I am. That's consciousness. It's a powerful statement because it reminds us that the consciousness is the only thing we cannot doubt. Remember? Even if we question everything else around us, the very fact that we are thinking proves that we are conscious. It's the most basic and undeniable part of being human. So the question isn't whether consciousness exists. That's obvious. But why? Why do we have it? The contingency argument answers the question, why do things exist? The consciousness... Argument answers, why, do, why, do, why, why does why exist? Why do I even have a why? Why do I even question things like why? What is a why? What is aboutness? Are you with me? You guys, you guys firing here? This is known as the hard problem. 
consciousness. Consciousness isn't something we can reduce to brain chemistry or physical processes. So this gap between the brain, what it does, and our inner subjective experience points to something deeper, something beyond just physical matter. Consciousness isn't a byproduct of neurons. It's a clue that there's more to reality than we can see. The best explanation for the existence of consciousness is that we were created by a personal conscious God. So the conclusion, therefore, God is the best explanation. I mean, ask somebody, what is the best explanation? It's a simple question. What's the best explanation for consciousness if there isn't a God? You're going to get deer in headlights. Consciousness points to a metaphysical dimension, a life of life. Metaphysical re refers to realities that go beyond the material. A purely a physical explanation can account for why we have these things. What are some other metaphysical things about our mind? Just think of some. What are, what are some things that we, we do that are not tangible, but we, we have? Fire them off at me. Love. Nurture for your children. How about processing mathematics, right? How about planning? Yeah, planning your day. <laughs> It's amazing how I can have multiple thoughts at the same time even. We're going next level, can't you? Yeah, exactly, multitasking. You can be doing something, your brain is allowing you to do something while you're thinking about something entirely different and about something. Let's break this down with some relatable examples. Remember, examples are good, right? The robot versus the human mind. Imagine you have a highly advanced robot. It can perform tasks, it can respond to commands, even mimic human speech and behavior. But no matter how advanced the robot is, it cannot have conscious. And this is the problem, right? We're talking about AI today. AI can never have consciousness. It's not going to have self-awareness. Now, some people are going to want to stone me today. Please don't. Your dog does not have a conscience. Your dog does not say, I wonder why I exist. doesn't think in that level. They, they have a brain. They can think, but that not consciousness in the sense of self-awareness. You ring a bell, they salivate, right? Dog, Pavlov's dog. Scientific experiment. Remember that? If you don't know it, it goes way back to you, you feed a dog, you ring a bell. You feed a dog, you ring a bell. You feed a dog, you ring a bell. Then you just ring the bell. He starts, I got a dog just like that. My dog starts drooling. Right? Which means your dogs don't, don't, don't think about, like, the dog doesn't run to the road and say, I wonder what's going to happen if I try to run across this road. If I stop here, will it be better? Boom! They just run out. There's a squirrel! Compare that to a human mind. We aren't just following programming. We're ex we experience things. We feel joy, sadness, love, spiritual connections. We reflect on thoughts, make decisions. We're aware of our existence. No matter how much we advance in technology, We've never and never will be able to create a machine that is conscious. It might mimic consciousness, but it's not conscious. This shows us that consciousness is something more than just complex programming or brain chemistry. How about this chocolate cake example? Imagine you're eating a slice of chocolate cake. You're not just tasting the cake. You're aware of the taste. You're savoring it. You're thinking, wow, this is a cake. This is delicious. Yeah. You can be thinking of the ingredients. You could be thinking about your grandmother who used to make this cake. And it's yummy at the same time. You're doing all these things. It's something that goes beyond mere physical processes. Consciousness points to a deeper reality. So there are objections, though. Couldn't consciousness just be an emergent property of the brain? Some people might argue that consciousness is just an emergent property, they call it, of the brain, that once the brain reaches a certain level of complexity, consciousness naturally emerges. But this doesn't explain how or why consciousness arises. We don't know why. It's the why. Why does it do that? Why would it even need to know that? Why would it even start to... How could it, first of all, if it couldn't think in the first place, how could it think itself into making itself into something, which is so ridiculous to me? It's called irreducible complexity. Have you ever heard of it before? You ever see a mouse trap? If you took a mouse trap and you just took one, a mouse trap is a pretty simple thing. It's got a spring, a little arm that holds it up. It's got a piece of wood. But if you take one piece off of that, it's not going to work, right? But then you think that we have 3.1 billion lines of code. Our eye has 40,000 
40,000 parts to it, just one eyeball. To think that all those things just decided, I don't even know how they would decide, since they don't have a conscious, but decided to come together to make an eye and then make a, a, a system like, a, like the cardiovascular system we have or a digestive system and put skin on us and decide all these things. I mean, just come on, man. Come on. Even the first cell. You can't even make it. We've tried. Trust me. You think scientists are trying to create one cell and you can't do it. A cell. Let alone a cell creating itself, multiplying. I always, this is just me. I could be wrong. I know I'm not a scientist, but I always thought to myself, let's say the cell out of pure will finally got to the place where it arrived. Well, wouldn't the sun just burn it up that day? I mean, wh- how did it then last on to multiply and had to, did it think about multiplying? I mean, just, I don't know. Here's, a, here's an objection. Another one. I don't know if I finished that one. Let me finish it. Even if brain activity correlates with consciousness, it doesn't explain consciousness. It, it doesn't explain why we're aware of our experiences. The best explanation for why we have consciousness is, is God. Objection two, what about animals? Now you guys have the answer, right? Animals do have some level of awareness, but it's not the same as humans. We are different. That's why the Bible says we were created in the image of God. Animals were not. They don't have that ability. And people try to act like their animals are like people, but they're not. But they're still companions. They're wonderful. God gave them to us to take care of, right? The higher level of consciousness points to the fact that we're made in the image of God with a deeper awareness and purpose that reflects God's nature. So here's the answer. Here's the question, the final question for this. Why does the, an abstract... Basically, this is an abstract question. It's deeply personal. The fact that we have consciousness means we're not just biological machines. We're not accidents. So here's the thing. If there is no God, there's no meaning. There's no purpose. You can write this down. It's really good. If there's no God, there's no meaning. There's no purpose and there's no value to life. Think about it. If we're just random, biological entities flinging through space, we're no different than a grasshopper or a tree or, or a piece of sand, There is no meaning. What what meaning would there possibly be? Zero meaning. We just are. There's no value. Who cares? Squash the bug. Squash the person. Squash the tree. Doesn't matter. It's all the same. There's no meaning. There's no value. There's no purpose. You know, people say, well, what's my purpose? Don't we all kind of wonder, what's my purpose? People are like, what's my purpose? Well, there is no purpose if there's no God. You're just stuff. Bye. Bye. Hope you don't die before I do. Isn't it true? So you appeal to them on, when you talk about consciousness. Consciousness lets us know we have meaning. There's meaning. <sighs> I, it's in me. I just know it. I know I'm, I'm meant to do something. That's why we love these great epic stories. We love them. We like to think of our life as being something and part of something and leaving something. We talk about legacy. We talk about meaning, value, purpose. This is all comes from consciousness. Without that, we don't have it. So to recap, God is the best explanation for why we have consciousness. Consciousness is not something that can be explained by natural or physical processes alone. It points to a deeper spiritual reality. The best explanation for that is the existence of a personal conscious God who created us with the ability to think, reflect, and be aware. Okay, I did have questions. I'm not going to give them all because we have to close out in about one minute. But I was going to give you some role-playing. I I wrote down... um, 10 different questions, and I want you to think of the five arguments. God is best explanation for... Guys, no, look at me. Don't look up there. God is best explanation for the beginning of the universe. God is the best explanation for the fine-tuning of the universe. God is the best explanation for objective moral values. God is the best explanation for why there's something rather than nothing, and God is the best explanation for consciousness, right? So which one of those five, I'm going to, now I'm going to, you're going to start thinking, well, when would I use these? I'm just going to throw out some scenarios and you try to figure it out, okay? So if someone says, I can't believe how perfect the weather has been this week. Man, it makes you wonder how everything just works out, right? Which argument? Fine-tuning, right? It doesn't just work out. It must, it, it opens a door. You're looking for doors, so you want to look for questions that will bring you to doors, right? This is a great opportunity to point out how the Earth's conditions, like atmosphere, weather patterns, are part of a finely tuned system that allows for existence. The universe precision 
suggests intentional design. How about this one? Sometimes I wonder why I'm here. Like, what's the point of everything? Consciousness or contingency. You can use both. Contingent says that you must be, you must, something must have created you. There must be a purpose for your existence. You don't, you don't just exist, but consciousness is a good one too. How about this one? I was watching a documentary about space. It's wild to think how big the universe is. Cosmological, right? Let me tell you about that. How about this one? Sometimes it feels like the world is just a mess. People are so selfish, and some of the worst things are happening in the world. Why is it like this? Moral argument. You, can, you know what someone says to you, remember? Why is, why, is, why, is, why is it so evil in this world? Well, or why they, why people say, I don't believe in God because there's evil. What is evil? How do you know it's evil? What are you comparing it to? Yeah. You can't define something as evil without God. It's impossible. Very good. See, kids, they get it faster than us. He is. But my, I was a pastor, and my son didn't get it like you, buddy. It's crazy how many stars there are in the sky. Do you ever wonder what's up there? Come on, guys. Easy. Cosmological. Do you ever think we're just like on autopilot? We're just like going through motions? Consciousness. I mean, these are real questions. People kind of come up with these weird things, right? How can you believe in God when there's so much suffering in the world? See, I'm, I'm saying the same things. I'm, it's repetition. Why do you think people try to make sense of everything? Some things just seem random. Fine-tuning. I've been thinking, isn't life just about surviving and getting what you can? I mean, what else is there? Contingency. Who said it? Yeah, good one. And then finally, sometimes I wonder, how do we even know we're thinking the right things or seeing the world accurately? What if it's all in our heads? Yeah, that, isn't that the matrix, man? The matrix, well, that's a tough one, man. I've, <laughs> I've gone round and round with people. How do we even know we're here, man? We're just like, what? <laughs> yeah, okay. I hate that marijuana is legal in this state. You must be having some. Okay, that's it, guys. We're going to close out for tonight, okay? Some things to think about, right? Good arguments? There's more. We could go a lot of more places. There's a lot of great arguments for God. Um, you can look them up. You can, I can give you some more if you want some more later on. Um, but these five, let's remember them, memorize them. Memorize them. Work at it this week, okay? Especially that list of the five. God is the best explanation list. Let's close in prayer, okay? Father, we thank you for this night. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your goodness toward us. God, the fact that we even can contemplate that, Lord, is so beautiful. The fact that we're even able to right now think with our minds, the beautifulness of our minds to talk to you, to, 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 to contemplate. As I'm praying, there are people in this room who are praying with me in their, in their minds, Lord, and you can hear and know and understand their minds because you are you're God Almighty, Lord. You're the creator of all things. We bless you. God, let us draw closer to you as we learn these arguments, Lord God. Let us see the beauty of your existence and who you are, Lord God, and your, your, the beautifulness, Father God, of your, your, uh, your supernatural fatherhood, Lord God, that you care enough for us that you made us. We bless you. We praise you. We worship you. We glorify you as King of Kings, as the creator of the universe, the creator of morality, Lord God, the God who, who finely tunes so many things, God, beauty, Lord Jesus, and just all that's around us. We thank you. We bless you. Thank you that we have minds to even contemplate you and that you created us fearfully and wonderfully, Lord God, the Bible says, to know you to experience you. I pray a blessing over us as we go. Keep us safe as we drive home and bless us the rest of this week for your glory and for your honor in Jesus' name. Amen.